So welcome. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Gaines. I'm the CEO and founder of Children's Funding Project. And today I am joined by one of my longtime friends and colleagues, Karen Pittman. Um, Karen is an award-winning leader in youth development that many of you will already know her name from that, from that arena. And she really made a career of starting initiatives and starting organizations and, and really just promoting big ideas about positive youth development, um, including while she was at the Forum for Youth Investment, where I spent a lot of time with her. Um, in addition to her work at the Forum and various roles she's played with America's Promise, National Urban League, Education Reimagine, I, okay, I could go on and on about all the places. Um, Karen also served in uh, President Clinton's administration as director of the President's Crime Prevention Council. And many boards, including our, our Children's Funding Project Board, um, where she was an inaugural chair of our board, and she's now in retirement um, and doing uh, KP Catalyst LLC, and she's focusing on just all of the knowledge that she's brought to the field and really synthesizing it in, in compelling ways for those of us who follow behind her. So um, Karen, I always value our time together. Thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. And you're not falling behind. You're 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 standing ahead. So don't don't uh, cut yourself short. So um, I I really can't even believe when I was adding up before we started to do this video how long we've known each other, and it's almost twenty years now. Um, and you've really been a, a mentor to me, and I've learned so much about what positive youth development is, and how the policies work, and how the programs and services should be more seamlessly knitted together for for young people to be successful. And um, in many ways, you know, our work together at the forum is what helped me to launch Children's Funding Project. Um, and I wanted this organization to expand on the foundational work that you and I did together and really like laser focus in on how are we gonna fund this? How are we gonna actually pay for the programs and services that we know that young people can benefit from? Um, and so, you know, given that you've spent your career focused on these things and, and are the one that taught me, I, I wanted to just, give you some space here to talk about, you know, what it really means for children and youth to be physically, emotionally healthy, socially and civically connected, um, academically and vocationally productive. Those are words that I to my because of you. So talk about um, sort of what that looks like for you. Yeah, well, you know, what that looks like when you put all those things together, it means that young people are thriving. Um, it means that they are, have a broad set of competencies um, that they can use, a strong sense of agency that they can actually accomplish what they want to accomplish, and a really strong sense of identity of who they are both individually and collectively as a part of a group of a community, a uh, racial and ethnic identity. That's what it means. And the challenge that we've always had um, in this country in particular is that when we slice those that broad set of competencies and outcomes into little pieces. I'm gonna help this kid become academically competent. I'm gonna help this kid not be pregnant. I'm gonna help this kid not use drugs. I'm gonna help this kid find a job. We lose the opportunity to actually work with them as whole people. And that's not just an abstract idea. That really is what positive youth development is about. Um, and so 40 years ago, I guess, long time ago, um, when I was working at the Children's Defense Fund, um, it, it really hit me that that if we come at this from a policy perspective at, at working on one problem at a time, the organizations that are most successful at working with young people, and you worked in one of these organizations, Elizabeth, said, okay, I'll take your money to prevent pregnancy. I'll take your money to help these kids not drop out of school. But what I'm gonna do is get to know them. I'm gonna build relationships with them. I'm gonna find out what their interests are. I'm gonna work on their strengths and assets. And then I'm gonna help them solve the problems along the way, but I'm gonna lead with an asset-based approach. And that's essentially what positive youth development is. It's an asset-based approach that's applicable in families, in schools, in community organizations, in peer groups. That's what it is. Um, and it, it's one that assumes and trusts that young people really do want to use their assets and build on their strengths to be connected, to be productive, to be healthy. And that what we have to do is help them get stuff out of their way. So that's what positive youth development is. There's a formal official definition of it that the federal government has adopted in 2008. Um, but that's what it is. 
And I feel like those of us who've done it right on the ground, we know what it is in, right. intuitively. I think that the, the message gets lost sometimes when we try to translate that knowing to policy and how to move resources out to uh, to children and youth and, and the programs that support them and those providers that really know how to reach them. And um, we, we try to create policy. So how, what does this positive youth development look like in practice from a, from a policy perspective? That's always been the tough question to get it from policy to practice um, because policies by design are tiny little pieces of things. I mean, we don't move big policies in this country. We don't have a, a positive youth development agency, we don't have, we have a definition, we have a little interagency working group that sort of lies under the radar screen hoping to stay in, in business while people are moving specific initiatives. Um, but, you know, when I went to run the children's, the, uh, the children's cabinet, um, the, the, uh, in 1995, the prevention council, mm -hmm. when we, the first thing I did was to say, how many federal programs are there that are supporting children and youth? And at that point, there were like 357 different federal programs across 13 plus different agencies, focus on all sorts of tiny things. You had programs to prevent, you know, pregnancy among 13 and under your age girls. So you had so many tiny programs and that's the problem. How do you get from a program that by the time it specifies, this is the audience, this is the solution, this is who should do it. And you pull that down to the community, is their job to then try to put all that stuff back together. Right. And that's where we fall apart. Our policies have to come in to communities that are strong enough to have an overall frame and vision for their young people that's holistic, but is specific enough that they then can take the pieces and knit them together. And that's where the Children's Funding Project becomes so important because you're putting out that vision and you're testing it with the public. If the public doesn't get the fact that you have to knit this stuff together, they're gonna be complacent about having it come in as a hundred different programs as serve kids. Right. Yeah, I'm just reflecting too on, on some of the things that we we landed on organizationally around, you know, yes, at the state and community level, relationships, relationships, relationships matter. You've got to do this coordination across the different systems that support children and youth. Um, so that's sort of the people lane. The the old adage that what gets measured gets done and the data, right? So we need to know how kids are doing and where they are and um, how programs are doing at intervening. Um, that's that data piece. And then, then as we went off to form Children's Funding Project, not thinking that it's just about the money, but certainly what gets budgeted is actually what gets done because, because there's not really um, any other way of, of motivating, you know, big government actors to, um, to, to prioritize things unless there's resources that go along with it. So yeah, that's, that's sort of where we see Children's Funding Project nesting in the, the larger ecosystem of, of the positive youth development world in this country, um, we want to focus on the money, but we know there's folks that are actively focusing on bringing the people together. We know there's folks that are actively focusing on having the data that's that's necessary. Um, what do you think is it's going to take for us to, to get there and get ourselves organized as a field in a way? I, I have this friend who is an astrobiologist, and I'm listening to his book right now, and he talks about how saving the planet is not going to be something that we innovate our way out of, that we have the innovations and those are those are all moving. It's going to be an organizational challenge. And, and I think that is really true of our field as well. On some level, there's there's all the actors out there and, and the work is being done and the innovations are happening. But what we need is a organizing um, frame. And I know you and I have struggled with this over time. I, I'd be curious if you have any advice for our field about how to just get ourselves working in the same direction better. <laughs> yeah, I've got lots of advice in that area. Um, and, and to activate it, I've really gone back to 20 years ago when positive development really was sort of in its heyday at even trying to get policy connected to practice at some level of scale. And the challenge that we had then was that we didn't have schools involved. 
positive development was what we were doing around schools. So we got the child welfare people, the juvenile justice people, the youth employment people. We had all those second chance organizations sort of, and obviously health prevention. Um, but schools were not in the, in the mix very much, or if they were, they were just there for their secondary purposes. Well, yeah, we'll do wraparound services. We'll let you in the building to do yeah. stuff, to help get the kids ready to learn, but they hung on to learning with a quite adequate definition of what learning was. What we have a chance to do now is to go back and pick up the very powerful framework that Michelle Gambone and Jim Connell and Diana Clem put out 20 years ago, the, the community action framework for youth development, which basically took that positive development idea and said, young, if we have a definition of young people, of young adult success, that is, but that we can measure, but it's basically young people need to be productive, they need to be healthy, and they need to be connected. And they went to the trouble of saying, how many young people actually are productive, healthy, and connected by a definition we can understand? Yeah. And it wasn't a rocket science definition. In your 20s, you're productive if you're in, in college or in a training program or employed, you're on your way towards economic self-sufficiency. You're healthy if you're managing risky behaviors and you've got healthy relationships. And you're connected if you're connected to something outside of yourself, a church, you're voting, you're in a civic organization, you've got some connection to a community. With that basic definition of doing well as a young adult in your 20s, they found only four in 10 young people were doing well and two in 10 were really struggling. And we took that data out to the communities and said, what, it, what the heck is going on that we're spending all this money on young people and we're getting this really crappy result? Yeah. And they said, well, yeah, we act, we act. if you give us that definition, we don't think our kids in our communities are doing that much better than this ANSI study did nationally. So you got people outraged with that very simple definition of we want them to be productive, we want them to be healthy, we want them to be connected, all three. And what they found was it didn't matter which ones, they just had to be doing well in two of those areas and okay in the third. So the idea that all of it's about academic success wasn't there. A kid can be mediocre academically. They had to get out of high school or get a GED, but then they could be doing well if they were, if they were healthy, if they were really connected, they could be building their skills and competencies in other areas. So what Gambone and Connell did, which was so powerful was they said, if that's the, if that's the outcome that we want, what do we need to be doing to get that outcome as a community? And so they backed up to say, well, what does a kid look like coming out of high school that actually then ends up being doing well as an adult? And that kid coming out of high school, first of all, had to graduate. They had to graduate with some reasonable C minus, B plus, B minus average. They had to come out with good navigational skills and a sense of purpose where they were going. That was it. And they said, well, if that's what they need to do, what are the supports that we need to get them there? And that's where the magic comes in because what they found was kids need to have strong relationships throughout high school. They need to be challenged, get challenging experiences in instruction, and they need to have a chance to contribute. And all three of those things were the, were the, the, the juice that put a push them into being ready to come out, coming out as ready to be young adults. And then the big question was, if we gave every kid those basic supports, healthy relationships throughout, throughout their high school years, chances to contribute, challenging experiences. Could we change that four in 10 number? And the research said, yes, we could change it from four in 10 to seven in 10. There are not many policy bumps that we can do that get that kind of a boost from putting in such simple supports. And so that comes back to the question of, if that's what kids need to have, the community as a whole has the power to do that stuff for kids, not just a school especially if academics is only one of the assets that young people need to have. So how do we get the community oriented towards the fact that they really can change the odds for young people? And that's where the Children's Funding Project comes in because yes, we have to have the people coming together to say, we can hold forces and do this together. We've got to have the data that doesn't chop kids up into slices and give some very powerful data the way Gambone and Connell did. How many are doing well in this holistic way? Can we get it down to a simple number of how many kids are doing well and not a long kids count? I love kids count, but not a long kids count list of how many are X number of things. Yeah. And when they did that, he said, well, the missing ingredient is we've got families and communities working with kids. We've got lots of public systems doing stuff. We've got activities for kids in their communities, but nobody's organizing that. And the juice is not more stuff. 
the juice really is creating policies and aligning resources in public and private sectors to support opportunity strategies. I'm reading directly off of their little piece. Yeah. And that's where you come in. It's the, the, the children's funding project, when you're coming into communities and building up that community capacity to actually activate for change, you're not just saying we need more programs, you're saying we need better leadership, mm -hmm. we need more coordinated services, we need a better and a different infrastructure that's got to have more flexibility to it, more customizability to it, but it's got to be equitable. And so that's where the public dollars are so important to come in, but it's not just for more services, it really is for more intelligent infrastructure. Yeah, and I love the, the simplicity of the, as, as a person who's parenting three boys between the ages of 17 and 24, um, coming out of this pandemic, I really appreciate the healthy, connected, productive, just, yeah. that's anybody that's who it. has young people in their lives, that's the three course, things. What do you want? Yeah. You know, on any given day, you don't prior, you prioritize those things differently, depending on where they exactly. are. Exactly, exactly. And you're lucky they can get to two out of three. So that's that, right. that realistic goal, <laughs> And then having the clear steps to back up towards that goal is really what can, can motivate communities. And why I'm so optimistic right now is that even before the pandemic, parents were realizing this. Yeah. But with the pandemic, when you look at the uh, populace just put out a, a purpose of education index, and they just show that parents could care less about when their kid goes to college. They want them to have a strong set of skills and competencies. They want exactly that. They want them to be healthy and have empathy and positive relationships and take care of themselves. They want them to have a sense of purpose and future. They want them to have character, whatever that means for them. Yeah. That's what they want. Right. And, they and that's everybody. Everybody wants everybody. everybody. There's yeah. no, there's no disagreement on that at all. Sort of a great equalizer, I think, in this, in this country, potentially, you know. Yeah. And 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 parents also, parents and teachers and youth workers sort of people in the, in the community youth workspace all agree that kids don't get enough of that in school. All of them agree. Teachers are very strong that they want kids to have after school experiences so that they can do things they're interested in. Yeah. So that they can find their own sense of self and competency. It's a sad statement that teachers are saying, you've got to take your kid out of the school and go find something that you pay for to give them things that help them become themselves. But that's where we are. And so the challenge that we have right now is how we can get parents to recognize that the flexibility and the customizability of what they get in communities, which is highly inequitable because everybody can't afford to get it and every community doesn't have it, that that could be what we ask the public education system to do. But right now the public education system is where I don't have high hopes for my kids in terms of learning, but it is a reliable, functional place where I can send my kid every day, they can get a hot meal, they can, you know, they can make friends. And so we work around it. And those and that's places, those got. schools are, are, are excelling when they're able to bring in all those community players that want to have an active role in that positive youth development. So absolutely. Yeah. And and this is not to, to damn schools because people in schools, teachers, administrators, they know this is what's going on. They just can't break the system. The system right. is so tightly integrated to do what it does that we need this community mobilization to happen. Yeah. And the best way to do it is the way you're doing it. Getting people to understand this basic definition of what success looks like for kids. Getting them to really believe that it's the community's responsibility, not in an abstract way, but with the dozens of organizations that are out there working and then asking them to challenge the infrastructure. Well, thanks, Karen. I always, even today, 20 years later, I learn all kinds of things from you. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking the time to, um, to talk with us. Where can people find you now? What are you doing now? What am I doing now? Well, I, I, I left the Foreign Youth Investment, um, which, we, which I started co-founded with Marita 20 plus years ago. Um, and I left primarily because I realized I was doing a terrible job as a CEO because this is what <laughs> I was doing. I was, it, the, the time was so right to move these ideas. I just needed to be in a nimble place to move ideas and not worry about how to fund 50 people. So Marita and I are now both a part of Knowledge to Power Catalyst, KP Catalysts, along with Catherine Plog Martinez. And as the three partners, we are just blending our skills together to be accessible to young people. So 
we are, we are amplifying ideas. We are, which is what I do in pro, you know, we are um, advising initiatives, mm -hmm. which all three of us do at the national, state, and local level. And then we really are aligning partners, which is always where Marita has excelled. How do you get the people to the table to think differently about this work? Um, so we're not very powerful as three people and two staff, but we are working with organizations that have the power to be able to change this if they can do it together. And that's our job to be a catalyst for getting people to do this work together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, and to learn more about Children's Funding Project and, and to view some of these images that Karen and I and others over the years have, have collaborated on, um, you, can, you can check out some links that we'll include with this video. Um, but thanks for watching today and um, we'll talk to you again soon, Karen. Thank you.